Welcome back. This is part two of the EXOVA presentation entitled Advances in Process Simulation of Agglomeration in Bioprecipitation. Part one dealt with the development of a new agglomeration chronology. In the current part two, we discuss how to calibrate the precipitation circuit model, and we also have a look at important aspects of existing rate equations for growth, nucleation, and agglomeration. You are encouraged to read the paper as well for further detail and understanding. Calibration. Calibration can either be performed on individual precipitators and sea tanks, or in certain cases, on a group of precipitators. We start calibration with a base case using normal operating conditions or perhaps average conditions over a particular stable period of time. There are four items to be calibrated. The size kernel parameters, the growth rate, the nucleation rate, and the agglomeration rate. These four items need to be calibrated simultaneously because each one of them affects the others. The calibration procedure involves two calibration loops. Firstly, an inner loop to determine growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate. This is done for model and plant at the same time because for the plant, we do not know these rates either. We start with the best guess starting values of the size kernel parameters. For instance, the default values provided in Cisco. The inner loop can be fully automated by using three PID controllers simultaneously to match model A to C with plant A to C, model particle count with plant particle count, and model minus 45 micron with plant minus 45 micron. Many white site process engineers would already be happy if these three criteria are satisfied, despite that the model PSD curve may still look quite different from the actual plant PSD curve. That's where the outer loop comes in. We adjust the size kernel parameters and run the inner loop again, and we repeat this process over and over again until we have achieved the best match between model PSD and plant PSD. We can judge that on the basis of standard deviation and by visual overlay of the PSD curves. So once we have reached that point, only then we will have the right values for growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate, as well as the correct values for the size form of parameters. The next step is to find out how growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate are correlated to such process variables as supersaturation, temperature, solids concentration, etc. This is table two on the slide. The elaborate method uses inner loop as well as outer loop. Thus, the size kernel parameters are in principle subject to change as well. This is labor intensive and a bit far fetched, considering that other kernels don't even have such set of kernel parameters to begin with. So for now, we will follow the simplified method and freeze the kernel parameters that we found in the base case for the particular precipitator or group of precipitators. In Excel, we have a large sanitized process database with daily records of a precipitator or group of precipitators. We rank the records according to one process variable at a time. For instance, we start with supersaturation. We subdivide the ranked records in say 10 data sets and perform inner loop calculations on the averages of each data set. This provides us with values for growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate for each data set. Subsequently, we do regressions 
of these three weights against the ranked variable, in this case, supersaturation, and obtain correlations for growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate as a function of the ranked variable. We repeat this process of ranking, subdividing, in loop calculations, and regressions for the other process variables, such as temperature, source concentration, etc. The correlations that we obtain will be distorted to a certain extent because the other process variables will not be constant over the ranked data sets. In order to eliminate this distortion, we interlink all the obtained correlations with all the ranked data sets. We do this for growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate separately. A process of cross autocorrection takes place in which the correlations for growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate converge to genuine correlations as a function of the respective process variables. It is advisable to use some common sense when doing the regressions and try to use established relationships for growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate. But what is an established relationship? Let's have a look at growth rate. There appears to be a large number of growth rate equations. Most of the rate equations have in common that the supersaturation is expressed in the form of alumina concentration minus the equilibrium alumina concentration. And the exponent is two. But there are some exceptions. For instance, the rate equation by Rochelle Cornell and co-workers of Alcoa, second from the bottom. It has a logarithmic supersaturation term and the power of this supersaturation term is three. According to a public domain publication around the turn of the century, this is the rate equation being used by Alcoa, at least at that time. Why is there such a variety in rate equations? To find the answer, let's have a look at crystal growth mechanisms. This picture here is not specific to gypsum. Spiral growth was found to be the main growth mechanism for gypsum in an Amira project in Australia around the turn of the century. But there are some doubts if this is correct. The nucleation type of growth definitely occurs, at the least at high supersaturation. Birth and spread is a frequently cited example of this type. The rate equations for the various growth mechanisms are known. They do not resemble the common growth rate equation that I showed you in the overview. Furthermore, the sigma is a supersaturation in a genuine form, namely as the thermodynamic driving force. And this is fundamentally a logarithmic expression. Remember the Cornell rate equation. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact formulation of sigma yet. But sigma is certainly not the same as A minus A equilibrium. Nevertheless, it is convenient to use A minus A equilibrium in rate equations. And there is no problem with that as long as we realize that this is an empirical expression which has no genuine scientific basis. We use it in SISCAP as well, for instance, in the form of the White-Bateman expression. The consequence is that the exponent of A minus A equilibrium is not exactly two. And in fact, it is variable. It varies from approximately two under low to medium supersaturations, up to about four under high supersaturations in agglomerators. The variability is not only because of different growth mechanisms and because of A minus A equilibrium not being equivalent to sigma, 
but to some extent also because of different growth rates between the different crystal phases. This all is not new, but it is also not common knowledge. Apart from having a flexible kernel for agglomeration, the SISCAT precipitated unit model also accommodates the flexible growth rate equation, in which, for instance, the exponent for supersaturation is adjustable. You will find and specify the different exponent for growth lengths than for agglomerates. You will find the exponents through long, long plotting of growth rate against A minus A equilibrium over the applicable ranges of growth rate and supersaturation of the particular precipitator or group of precipitators. Nucleation rate. The equation that is often used, also in Siska, is the one by Chuck Misra from his PhD thesis of 1970. We know that nucleation rate increases with reducing temperature. Data in Misra's thesis, I have calculated an activation energy of minus 54 kilojoule per mole. The supersaturation power is two. Interestingly, Misra made a side note in his thesis that a power of four seems to give better fits at certain temperatures. This is not a surprise in view of what I just mentioned about growth rate under high supersaturation. In summary, it would be better to include an Arrhenius term in the equation and make the exponent of supersaturation adjustable. The equation in SISCAT will be made more flexible on these two points in the near future. Agglomeration depends on cementation. Thus, it is logical that agglomeration rate expressions in the literature show the agglomeration rate to be proportional to growth rate. The growth rate of interest here is specifically the growth rate that belongs to the growth mechanism responsible for cementation. This is probably a contact type nucleation growth rate, whereby two surfaces in contact form a wedge in between which the activation barrier for nucleation growth is reduced. This may well be a different growth rate than the growth rate responsible for regular growth, at least under certain conditions. The overall growth rate may be a composite of two different growth rates. Is the agglomeration rate then still proportional to the growth rate as we measure it? I don't know. My own plant data analysis suggests it is not. Therefore, it is probably better to relate agglomeration rate to supersaturation instead of to growth rate, just as for nucleation rate in the Mishra expression. Finally, the dependency on solids concentration. There is no consensus in the literature about the effect of solids concentration except that the effect is negative, ranging from slightly negative to inversely proportional. Earlier, I showed you the method of cross-linking correlations with different sets of process variables in order to filter out the noise effects that process variables have on each other. That works fine as long as process variables are not strongly related to each other. In the case of growth rate, there is a strong inverse relationship with solids concentration. That is how we often control the degree of agglomeration, namely through variation of seed charge, so as to vary growth rate. In this plot here, for example, for an agglomerator, you see that the agglomeration rate is proportional to the ratio of growth rate and solids concentration to the power of almost one. But if I use the same data, then I long, long plot agglomeration rate against growth rate only, thus assuming that there is no effect of source concentration, 
then the agglomeration rate is proportional to growth rate squared. The slope in this plot becomes two. These are the results of some recent studies on a limited number of data. The only conclusion that can be drawn at this point is that there is still some uncertainty about the effect of measured growth rate with emphasis on measure and source concentration on agglomeration rate. Again, SISCAP is flexible in this respect by allowing the exponent of growth rate and source concentration to be specified separately. Conclusions. The combination of a new agglomeration term in SISCAP with an advanced calibration procedure allows tailor-made modeling of PSD development in each precipitator. The relationships of growth rate, nucleation rate, and agglomeration rate with, for instance, supersaturation are more complex than can be captured in simple expressions. For that reason, additional flexibility has been built into SISCAP that allows the user to specify exponents of important variables in expressions according to the outcome of sensitivity studies per individual precipitator. Default values are provided for a start. These are very recent developments in SISCAP of which some aspects are still in the implementation stage. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you.